Hello, welcome to my home. I would love to give you a tour of my minimalist apartment. I owe a deep apology to all of my fans who may feel betrayed by my actions. I have just been informed that I do not qualify as a minimalist. Obviously. Here's my problem. I find myself deeply attracted to minimalism. The idea that by owning fewer possessions, you can be hyper intentional about everything you do own. Minimalists avoid the trap of filling their home with consumer stuff and then buying bigger homes to put more stuff and storage units for the excess stuff that was originally purchased to fill a void in their soul or to impress their terrible friends. But the thing is, as much as I want to get rid of 80% of my possessions and finally be free, I'm also deeply attracted to and basically am a 17th century dissipated and disgraced baron who exists to turn my home into a cabinet of curiosities, a mix of art and the wonders of the natural world. Taxidermy ermine? Check. Wax disease moulage? Check. Bat in a jar? Check, check, checky check. So how do I reconcile those two parts of myself? Here's the secret. Both projects, minimalism and this particular type of collecting, are in their way journeys to death acceptance and death positivity. I shall explain. A major cornerstone of my advocacy is helping people to see the cycle of life and death, the cycle of decay and renewal, as being natural, even beautiful. So I like being surrounded by reminders of that in my home. My home is filled with memento mori, visual reminders that we will all die. And the resurgence of popularity of Wunderkammer, these private cabinets of curiosity, I think is motivated by a desire to be confronted in our daily lives by the things we've become most distanced from as a society. And it's just pretty. I like these things, haters. Minimalism, on the other hand, I was never that interested in, as I've always been known for the excessive dark antique look in my living spaces. But probably about six years ago, I had a revelation, which was what would happen if my home burnt down? Now, this doesn't sound that revelatory, but it set off a chain of thoughts that made me understand I was way too attached to my things, that I could not even conceive of them going away and I had let them come to define me. To face this fear and to start letting things go, I became a very early acolyte of Marie Kondo. And to this day, I will not accept an unkind word about her. I love her so much. What I think she recognized is quite important, which is that many of us humans develop an anthropomorphic relationship with our things. Items in my home have feelings and a personality and guilt associated with them. So letting go or giving them away is like a little death. Did you ever notice that when they interview the hoarders on the TV show Hoarders, the pathological hoarding always started after a particularly painful death or loss. Eventually, for these folks, getting rid of things almost becomes like a separation too much to bear. You would have noticed that pattern if you had watched 9,000 episodes of the show Hoarders. Like me. <laughs> People make fun of Marie Kondo for encouraging us to thank things for their service before getting rid of them. But that was huge for me because it allowed me to hold a small grieving, almost death ritual for the items I was sending out of my life. It relieved some of the guilt I felt for letting things go. So if cabinets of curiosity are death awareness, death confronting, minimalism is perhaps death acceptance. A friend of mine, Rob Ringham, wrote a blog for our Order of the Good Death site about death and minimalism. Now, Rob is a serious longtime minimalist, so he didn't pull any punches about the connections between death acceptance and owning fewer things, saying, It's a fact of death that our once treasured possessions will be ditched unceremoniously. Your sci-fi paperbacks will not be gently escorted to the Library of Congress and shelved with a little plaque with your name on it. Your record collection will not be sealed into the tomb with you. Our stuff is unlikely to be used or valued by descendants. They'll see it as a nuisance and want rid of it as quickly as possible 
because they already have too much stuff without inheriting ours. Now, that's not true for everything. You may want your mom's paintings or your dad's yearbook. You may want old photos. But let's be honest, you don't want all your parents' stuff. A massive suburban home filled with stuff. The 50 years of Christmas decorations, the toilet paper cover collection, the 47 boxes of unlabeled paperwork. This exact issue is the cornerstone of something called Swedish death cleaning, which seems like something I would have made up, but no, it's real. It's reducing the things you own toward the end of your life, so those left behind, like children or a spouse, are not sifting through junk for months after you're gone. The question to be asked with Swedish death cleaning is, will anyone I know be happier if I save this? This is where I personally end up on this. I'm obviously not a minimalist in the Instagram goals, here's my perfect sustainable size 6 capsule wardrobe sense, but I do find myself thinking, I don't need to wait until the end of my life to reduce the possessions that burden me. That plant over there doesn't burden me. Shantae, you stay. But there are possessions like paperwork and clothes and 17 bath towels that I've accumulated as if I'm going to live forever that are a mental burden. Like, hi, I'm your dust-covered roommate that never leaves, and I don't need them. I've done three major condo-like purges in the last six years, the most recent being a few weeks ago. Each time I'm horrified at how much I've allowed into my home and how wasteful it will end up being as I donate and recycle all this crap. So one of my goals this year is not buying a bunch of new stuff and accumulating things to only purge them two years from now. I can keep my death confronting items that, yes, spark joy, while keeping the depths of my closets and storage minimalist death acceptance zones. Women really can have it all. What is that balance for you? Have you found it for yourself? Also, tell me the books and videos and content you found on both ends of the spectrum. Will I consume them all? Yes, I will. YouTube videos don't take up any space, plus there hurts. This video was made with generous donations from death enthusiasts just like you. I think thanking items for their service is in many ways what we're trying to achieve with funerals for humans. Touching the body, spending those moments, thanking the person for their service in your life, and then allowing yourself to let go. That is the process of grieving. Minimalist head.